कैसा है घर जाएंगे ना तो सब लोग पहले नहाते हैं बरोबर है तो पांच मिनट तो तब तक आ जाएंगे सर हाँ या सो आई रिक्वेस्ट डॉक्टर पुरुषोत्तम काले जनरल सेक्रेटरी ऑफ ए टी बी एस टू एक्सटेंड अ वेरी वॉम वेलकम टू वेरी वेरी एमिनेंट आई वुड फर्स्ट से टीचर एंड देन साइंटिस्ट प्रोफेसर मदन मोहन चतुर्वेदी जी टू आवर झुंझुन वाला कॉलेज वर्चुअल प्रोमाइस सो thank you so much i would thank atbs also for uh, collaborating with us and uh, this is a very great opportunity for all of us to spend evening to learn again revise and again look into what is happening around and uh, with this i request uh, dr kare to introduce our eminent speaker for today's evening dr kare namaskar everybody I'm Dr. Purushottam Kale, Secretary of Association of Teachers in Biological Sciences, and I'm here to introduce President of Association of Teachers in Biological Sciences, Professor Madan Mohan Chaturvedi. Professor Chaturvedi is currently with the Department of Zoology, teaching biochemistry and molecular biology, and is. research interests are in chromatin remodeling and regeneration of gene expression inflammation and cancer and epigenetic regeneration of liver regeneration well he has been an msc and phd from uh, bhu and uh, has done his postdoc in the laboratory of eminent professor charles wisdom university of zurich switzerland he has been a visiting scientist and visiting professor at md anderson cancer research center anything ma'am speaker mic on hai kisi ka na mic on ho gaya hoga okay namaskar okay. sir ye bhi mic is on नहीं काम करेंगे इनको बोलते हैं ना डीपी को सबका म्यूट करने ओके सो प्रोफेसर चतुर्वेदी हैज बीन विजिटिंग साइंटिस्ट एंड विजिटिंग प्रोफेसर एट एमडी एंडरसन कैंसर सेंटर यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ टेक्सास होस्टन यूएसए एंड इज स्टिल हैविंग अ रिसर्च कोलैबोरेशन विद दैट लैब वेल एकेडमिक delegation that um, visited israel jordan and palestine with president of india he was a member of this delegation well he has over 70 research publications in various national and international journals of repute he also has participated in over 100 national and international conferences in which many of the scientific sessions he has chaired he has been a fellow of a large number of organizations very difficult to cite all of them but to mention a few he has been a fellow of national academy of science allahabad young scientist uh, medal he has obtained from university of uh, sorry indian uh, national science academy in 1992 diamond jubilee fellowship of national academy of science alabad he also has received a fellowship of swiss national science asian molecular biology organization clayton foundation fellowship and so on well he has always been a very brilliant student and had obtained gold medal of bhu in 1978 he has been in several national and international organizations in various capacities he has been on board of governors and board of management of csfc university baroda chairman of government bodies of um, uh, governing bodies of arsd college gargi college shahid bhagat singh college and so on well 
he has been uh, heading the zoology department from um, 2017 to 2020 currently now he has been director of cluster innovation center from 2011 to 2016 dean research in life sciences from 2012 to 2016 director of institute of lifelong learning from 2010 to 2012 director of cpdhe director of um, center for science education and communication all university of delhi his cv runs into many pages but i believe more than everything else as usha madam has already said he has been an excellent teacher and a researcher as well so let us now hear from him over to you chaturvedi sir thank you kale sir <laughs> and thank you dr usha mokhendran ji for giving me this opportunity to share some of my thoughts to you in an online mode which is as we all agree this is a new uh, new way of now teaching and interaction and this is going to be there uh, we would be have to accept it and uh, so uh, i'm really I'm happy that i was invited and i very gladly accepted it Uh, the Junjunwala College. I have also earlier visited in person and given a lecture some time back. And as the time permits and once the scenes become normal, if I visit to Bombay, I will again like to come and interact in person as well. Now, ATBS. I am part of the ATBS, so I don't want to thank ATBS because it will be thanking uh, yourself. You have to uh, thank yourself. But then, uh, the, the, uh, Dr. Kale, Dr. Naik. Uh, when they said we are starting Junjunwala College, starting a series of lecture, and part of an ATPS, uh, would you agree to give a lecture? I said, as a teacher, we are always ready to give a lecture, and I said a couple of topics, and finally, I agreed to, to a topic which I is very dear to my heart, and you will realize at the end why I have chosen such a broad a topic. Looks like a little confusing. what do i want to tell with this philosophical topic a research mindset quest for a truth uh but and and in this topic i will slowly run through it and maybe uh, 45 minutes as i have been allotted for a research presentation if i exceed i will try to finish within 40 45 minutes if i exceed 5 6 minutes please forgive with me the reason i chose this topic i will elaborate it but very simple i'm not going to tell anything novel as of now to any of you all the terminology and many of the examples which i have chosen one of the large example which i'll try to make use of i explaining this example is everybody knows those example and that is called uh, the, the the current sars cov 2 pandemic all of us are concerned whole of the globe is concerned about that but why people are not able to get any answer and why everybody is Uh, groping in the dark now, i will try to explain uh, with the research philosophy and methodology uh, with, with that topic now since i'm my topic looks to be the slide is not changed uh, my topic uh, looks to be uh, slightly philosophical but let me begin by disclaimer i'm not a philosopher so any i have never read a philosophy at all except that i have learned while doing research i have learned to to use this terminology or jargons of philosophy so what i will try to simplify based on my understanding the simplest term what this terminology means to you and at the end of it every researcher whether it is a social science whether it is a humanities whether it is literature whether it is sciences whatever we want to call it as it or engineering or mathematics each one of us ultimately we are trying to search for a truth now how do we define the truth Are, are we able to look for a truth? That's exactly in a different context. I'm trying to want to explain to you with examples. Some examples I may take a general example. You have to bear with me. I understand all of you are from a science background, uh, so the lecture should have been focused to the science. But since this lecture, I have also given to a general audience. So my examples are some examples are also from a general audience purposes. So you have to bear with me. But I hope those examples will explain. the terminology which i want to explain to you 
as I said, uh, had a habit of asking apology to begin with. And you all will agree with you. The reason I want to do this uh, simply because often I become very critical while explaining the thing and inadvertently I may use certain strong words at uh, certain things which may not be liked and may hurt somebody intention. Please forgive me and my apology in advance to begin with. I have no intention of, but as a, as a teacher, as a researcher, sometimes we get disturbed. So I have a strong comments and observations to make. So my, I also begin with this one. Now, the way I have organized my 40 minute discussion is I will a little bit tell us the history and I will use two terminology. Many of you are familiar with, uh, but if not, uh, I will explain to you in the simplest term what is called ontology and epistemology. These two terminology ultimately makes the basis of our research, basis of our asking question in research. But as I said, most of the time, my explanation will revolve around SARS-2, but how uh, the, in a, in a sars cov 2 example, these two terminology will fit into. And at the end, I will conclude uh, bringing that what is the tenets of research and what are the limitations of that with the research in the, any area, related to biological sciences, related to social sciences, for humanities. Now, very general, this is very my common question to any, everywhere I go, why our PhD degree is called Doctor of Philosophy. Why it is not called Doctor of Science, a Doctor of History, Doctor of Mathematics, Doctor of Physics, why should it be? That means if it is called philosophy, obviously each degree will converge to a point. And when we say a research mindset is nothing but analytical, objective, and uh, logical. So this logical analysis and objectivity ultimately is very commonly discussed in terms of philosophy as well. So obviously the research has a very deep, uh, is uh, rooted in the uh, principles of philosophy. In a very simple term, a research has to acquire a new and reliable knowledge. And this definition is universal definition, irrespective of a science humanities and social science model. So it has to have a, a new and a reliable and repeating all of them. Also, I want to remind to all of you quite often, particularly in the biological field, and more so if I'm doing a, what is so-called molecular biology or biotechnology research, often we keep jumping. If I've cloned a gene, if I have a, a done a whole microarray to collect a data, whole set of a gene expression, we all think as if I have done the research. Now remember, doing an experiment is not a research. Collecting a data is not a research. Looking for literature is not a research. Each one is important for research, but this research is a much more beyond these things. This very component of research, in the research, what is most important is asking a question. It is often said, all of you will agree, you all have done research, you all are teacher and researcher, you will all agree, it is said, if a, if, if a right and a question is asked in a research, your half of the PhD, half of the research is done. Now, here, we have to distinguish. Questioning mind is called inquisitiveness. Now, a child is very inquisitive, but we cannot say a child inquisitiveness is compared with an aptitude for research. The aptitude for research has to have a certain research mindset, and that has to follow certain tenets of research. This is the way. I so I can ask a hundred of a question, but if my questions are not asked in a right context, in a right frame which can be tested, which you all know, then it's not a right question. So asking a question is the most important part of research. And this is where I'm going to spend most of the time that how and why the question should be asked. And exemplifying with the sars cov 2 why we are not able to come to a solution because we are not asking a right question while understanding sars cov 2 pandemic as well. Now, historically, I'm not saying the research began only in the 15th century, uh, even from the Socrates and, and Aristotle time, the research was that the mindset, observation, the philosophy existed. But the modern research traced back to scientific Renaissance goes back into uh, 15th to 17th century to the modern time. And what simply says is that there is a development of a scientific method, which involved testing of a hypothesis of a verifiable data and it has to be relying upon provable fact, not on the theory, not on the conjecture. Much before that, 
people were, there, there were a lot of conjecture, there were a lot of theory, and you have to adopt the theory without proving the facts. So, a few names I'm going to quickly run through this, where I consider to be very important in the scientific renaissance. There are many more, there are many, but these this, this few names which I get impressed, I've done some reading about them. The first name which emerges in my mind, if I have to explain about modern foundation who have laid for the modern science and research, it is René Descartes. He's a mathematician and philosopher, uh, highest degree. He's one of the famous statements, many of you know, when he said in Latin, that is the cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am. What he has made a premise is two. One is anything and everything which is saying an object, it must be questionable. We must question an object. Existence must be questioned. And subsequently, he relied on a very principle of scientific measurement. Today, all science measurement which you do, it must follow a certain four tenets of measurement, which all were laid by originally by René Descartes. So I consider it a very important. Francis Bacon, an English philosopher, what his basic was that the, the scientific tenets must be universal, must be useful for a human man. That means he laid a foundation to the application of a science. Isaac Newton, I did not to tell who Isaac Newton is, innovation and scientific revolution. All of us know the examples and whole, even understanding the today universe, understanding the modern physics, what we call, all were laid by Isaac Newton. Primarily he was not, he was more of a mathematician than a physicist, but mathematical philosophy, he brought into the scientific methods. Immanuel Kant is the one which, very important to say the things exist in themselves. That means there are properties of each thing in a nature which we must be question, must be unknowable. However, the interrelationship can be understood. So in a way, indirectly, he brought about a cause and relationship. And the modern term, the last name I will take for example, is the Karl Popper, many are familiar with. Karl Popper becomes very important, even though he's not a, within the 15th and 17th century, he's a more of a modern uh, 20th century. Um, and his famous, uh, falsibility or what we call the null hypothesis. That all those who have done research and collected data and done their t testing, they basically we try to test null hypothesis. I'm not here to explain what null hypothesis is, or his famous example is also on for black till we prove them to be wrong. So, that, so he had been extremely important and he said the scientific data and scientific observation should be free from the feeling and belief of the science scientist itself. So observer should not put his or her own liking and disliking, which often happens in the science we get carried away by. Therefore, he brought the theory of falsifiability. So initially to begin with, we try to discard a hypothesis and scientifically, if you're not able to discard, we accept it. Now with this example, let me come back to look for a truth. So this is the little historical diagram I wanted to share. If there are some students, they should read these people ultimately uh, to understand the tenets of science or tenets of research or theology. I'm a zoologist. I've done MS in zoology. In a forum, I give a lecture. This is one of my very, oh, before that, let me again tell you, there are three things which I'm going to, as I mentioned, the ontology makes the pillar, epistemology begins, depends upon ontology, and finally is a methodology. The methods are not methodology. Often researchers get confused. And finally, once these three things are properly defined for any research question, then rest is very easy. So ontology defines why, epistemology defines, epistemology defines uh, what, why, and how. It's a very standard question, but in the philosophical terms, the other terminology. And epistemology and terminology, uh, ontology, they are sometimes interrelated. Each one has their own way to explain. And I'm going to explain this terminology very quickly to you. What ontology, if you a dictionary meaning of ontology means, you want to understand the nature of being. That means, in a, a, before I ask a question, a, a question must be ontological question, the existence of an object or a nature, how, what is existence, what is a being, and what do we define in modern terms? We define the property in terms of their relationship. That means, no object cannot can be defined without its interrelationship with the surrounding objects. And today, ontology has created a, a automatically believes and, and, and relies on a large data set. 
So today, if I want to define an object, and I'm more interacting partner, more data set I have, I'll be very easily able to explain the, uh, my question becomes more pertinent to that. I will explain this in, a, in, a, in another five, 10 minutes to you what exactly it means. Now, let me come back to my famous example, which I keep giving being an MS in zoology. And this is this. Now, since it's not a phase two phase three thing, so I will not have a time to ask for an answer, and et cetera. But here is a picture of a rat. And now uh, I could have asked a different question about this object and asked you to, but my question is, I say it is a rat, but I want to define the rat. My question is, what is a rat? And now I don't uh, feel it bad. Anybody who has done animal science or biology or zoology, believe me, if I start asking you, you will not be able to define even today, what is a rat? The reason is why, if I ask a definition, you will tell me comparison. You will say, well, this is a living system, so I will compare with a non-living system. Those who are more, more fussy will start classifying it, say mammal, rodent, et cetera, et cetera. But classification alone does not define a rat. Description alone does not define it. In a zoology, we will cut the rat out, we will take out different organ system, we will dissect it out, it will still not make a rat. So I may reduce the rat to its different component, yet I can't reconstruct it. So there's a problem here. If I can't reconstruct it, yet I can't create a system. So as of now, it remains undefined. Believe me, ask yourself, when did you learn to define a rat? If I ask you, a whole audience, think of it. When did you learn to define a rat? Even though you have done a PhD in zoology, don't feel it offended. Ask yourself, when you were a child, at that time you might have seen a photograph, you might have seen a movie, you might have seen something, and that's the only definition that you have in mind. Your whole teaching of zoology it does not help you in defining that in your understanding that you know why it is a rat because you have seen when you were a child a moving rat or a picture of a rat or a movie of a rat somewhere and that still is in your imprinted in your mind in terms of definition at that time and today's present zoology is not. Now why we are not able to define it is a problem because we are not able to draw its interrelationship. If I start defining the rat with in terms of its interrelationship, the property will be called emergent property. Then I can define rat as an emergent property. So problem in the today's biology is, I will explain you a little later when I come to epistemology, our, our definition of biology is only for biologists. It is, it is restricted to the domain within the biology. Therefore, our definition of our biological terms and phenomena and objects are, forgive me, subjective to biologists. This is not universal definition. If the definition is objective, that will be universal. That means the mathematician will see the object in the same way. A physicist will see the object in the same way. A philosopher will see the object in the same way, the way a biologist will see it. But today, all our biological phenomena in a large number of cases remain to the domain of the biology. So people have done, I will not go into detail. Now I can simplify the biological definition by saying, okay, a rat is a rat because it is able to reproduce. It can eat some non-licking living system and create certain things within itself, metabolism, whatever. And it self-organizes itself and it self-reproduces. That property is, becomes little understandable to mathematics and physicists when we call self-organizing, self-reproducing, and these two together gives us a property, of what we call as a, is it becomes an interactive, sorry, it is a, uh, yeah, interactive, yeah, it's an interactive system. It is a, so the rat or any animal is a monolithic structure cannot be explained. I have to look for its internal component. I have to reduce its internal component, look for its intera interaction internally, and try to what emerges out of it. I have to look for emergent property. And therefore, a new terminology has come in there. So today biology is a, well, systems biology. Systems biology, we study the interacting property, or the emergent property. Now let me explain uh, whatever it may all sound uh, very vague to many of you. It may out sound some philosophers to you, but let me explain what is being my interactive system. Suppose there are two objects, A and B, and I say they're interactive. I don't know how, how what are they interactive, but do I, suppose I say, you believe me, A is an employer and B is an employee. So A has a company and A hires B to do a job. Now, if 
A and B, the way they would interact with each other, what will come out of is a corporate property will come out of it, an interaction of A and B. That means now I can define the nature of a B in terms of what emerges in that corporate, what emerges in that company because of the interaction of the B. But A and B do not interact only with that property. A may have a multiple other roles to play. If A is the owner of a company, then A could also be financing. Whereas if B is doing a company, suppose the B is doing a company job of HR. That means the B is also interacting with other companies. Or if the B is uh, doing the logic strip chain management, then he has uh, some other job to play. So see, or A also has a family, uh, B also has a family, and they have a multiple interaction. So say multiple two. So what I'm trying to say is, if I want to define the property of A as a whole in relation to B, the property of A and an object, if I want to ask a question, what is an A? Now, A cannot be defined unless I see all possible interaction of the A with relate to B. The A property can only be defined if you know all interacting partners. So when I want to ask a question, ontological question about A, that means as many property I know, better I will be able to define, better question I can ask. And those. So now let me simplify in a much more simpler term. Probably you'll understand it. Oh, here is an object. I don't know what the object is. And I want to understand something. So I want to look for an interacting part. Now, somewhere I find this object was born in Gujarat. Now, obviously, what this object would be, I'm, I'm trying to briefly explain to you, and you start understanding it. Now, so there's a, there's a relationship between the object, which I want to question, ontological question, with the, the object was born in Gujarat. Then I say the object played a very important role for the country like India. So here's another approach. Now, if, if these two property only, I try to explain to you, then you start defining object. I know many of you would have started guessing what I have in mind. Probably I have something else in mind, but you must be guessing by, about somebody else. Saying the person is born in Gujarat, person is playing a very important role for India. You all know probably what I mean. I don't want to get into the political discussion. However, if I start defining more interaction, well, the object is studied law with England. Now suddenly, your imagination about what you viewed with the two interaction, now suddenly your idea about the object or the proper definition of object is now changing. Then I say, still it is be a multiple definition for the same object. But if I say the object became famous because of some of his work in South Africa, with the four properties, the moment I explain the four property, I think there's no question about anybody's mind who I'm referring to, Mahatma Gandhi. Now, so what I'm trying to say, this is exactly called uh, ontologically, the, the defining an object will depend upon how many interaction I'm defining, and these interaction will create an emergent property for a new, and you can define the property much more specifically. Now, here I've chosen only four interacting things, but Mahatma Gandhi had many more interests. If I say he had a Satyagraha movement, he was the performer of the Satyagraha Hinsa, he, the quit India movement he brought into, and, and he became internationally famous because of his lifestyle, because of his behavior. He has, uh, so I, basically with this object and more interaction, you can also write the history of uh, India in relation to Mahatma Gandhi's vision and thoughts that what kind of an Amaraj he was visualizing. So more and more uh, interaction you bring into, better and better you will be able to define the object. Now, that's the exactly when I ask a question in research. Now, the question has to be defined based on the interaction. Now, again, come back to the biological property. Now, a self-organizing self system, which is called system biology. In today's research, I have to define internal components. I have to define metabolites, protein, genes, and signaling, and each object I have to define the interacting uh, relationship, the strength of relationship, and each node or each object is interacting with how, how much. And slowly I start creating an interacting system and in cell, I'm trying to define a living system, property of a living system. Otherwise, de so defining, suppose I say digestive system, I take away all the organs and put in a tray, doesn't make it as a system. 
and the isolation system cannot be studied in isolation with the nervous system. Nervous system cannot be with isolation with the. So it has to be studied as an interactive part. But unfortunately, we keep teaching this system in isolation and we never teach an interactive part. Now, today's biology, you can see a metabolic network in the East, a gene regulatory network, anything. I can say proteome interaction, and this is how systems are defined. So today, if I want to do, in a true sense, a biological system, I want to understand it, it has to be a network system, it has to be an interacting partner, then only, and all these properties are derived based on ontological consideration. I said, ontology means more interacting system, more data set, better the object becomes this model. So till now, whatever biology we had been doing, it was a good, but it was more of an observational, more of a, a theory-based biology, but not explaining the true property, true question of biology. This, this whole uh, network system doesn't apply only to biology. In fact, today is applied to whole social network. I can use this social network system. One of the famous examples today nowadays we have is a average family of RGCF. You can use this network system to explain the spreadness of a disease. You can track the spreadness of a disease. You can make, track the social movement. You can do machine relationship, election management, business and commerce. So, so the defining anything, I want to understand business, I want to understand the spread of a disease. My question becomes a better definable if it is defined in an ontological context. And I'm repeating again, ontology is nothing but its relationship and interacting partners and more and more relationship, more and more partners do I search for it, better definition I have of my question. And then subsequently, subsequently what becomes is what do I do? I have a question and I want to understand it. And then it comes to be epistemology. And what epistemology means, it is a theory of knowledge. Knowledge itself is a study of knowing. Now here's theory of a knowing, a study of knowing. And that simply means that is the, the methodology, the validity, scope, and uh, it has to be different from a belief and opinion. This, this has to be uh, not dependent upon that. So in a nutshell, what an epistemology says, how do I know what do I know? That means what do I explain about interacting ontological question? Question is how do I know that is there? That means I have to now go to a second set of a, a test by creating a, a creating a, uh, a existence in which ultimately my next method of research, that means my hypothesis generation, my variable formation will all have a have a bearing on the epistemological argument. Now let me come back to the biological system. As I mentioned earlier, if I want to define biological system with subject to approach or a biology approach, as we call it as a, that means I am within the biology. Most of the subject, I'm not saying subject to approach is wrong. Many of the social science and smaller data set, people do use in a cultural study, people do use subject to approach because the data set are very small. But here, in a, if I am within the problem, that means my explanation of a problem is in a limited scope and based on the viewer's perception, viewer's belief, and that is where in a social science we say many times this belief I'll come to that later, that if I want to understand the truth of a problem, a society and a culture, we say, oh, truth is constructive. So, and that is this, the whole, even though they want to study the truth, but constructivism is nothing but a more of a subjective. Whereas a, a, a realism will be more that I view the system outside. That means whether A views the system, B views the system, enough person views the system, every person has to view the system in the same way. That means it is objective approach, it's reliable, reproducible, and universal. So objective approach is a most of in, a, in, a, in a anthropology, people define both subjective and objective, having given different jargons name, in the critical approach, let's not bother about it. So that means after ontologically question defining the property of an object, how do I study the object that is defined by my epistemological approach. Now let me come back now next 10, 15 minutes, I will, 10 minutes, I will uh, try to explain the whole thing and where is the problem with respect to this novel SARS-CoV-2. Now there are three concepts. One is called truth is real. That means there's a new virus which is spreading the infection. Somebody say no, that there's not one, one virus. I believe in multiple truths, and this is called relativity. And I said, yes, there were influenza virus earlier, and there are new virus, then there are, so there can be multiple virus. There's no single virus. So you may be getting infected with multiple viruses. I don't know, both may be true, 
and each one cannot be disqualified, or as I said, constructed. And I believe me, even the country like USA, where the large number of people are resisting whatever we ask for today to do the lockdown, to do the follow the social distancing, wear mask. They say they believe in nominal, nominalism. They say, no, it's a constructive truth. I don't care about this hype. I'm not going to die. There's nothing called a virus. You all just want to create. Believe me, if I have to argue and explain philosophically, I can say maybe possibly, yes, this constructive truth is true because some of this hype has been created to dismantle the world economy in such a way to influence the shift of economy towards another country. And that is partly also happening. So what I'm trying to say is that, so even though in a science we believe in a single truth or realism, there is a possibility of a multiple truth, but equally possible the truth could have been created and if truth is created in some way to help and influence, so it may be biased to some extent, but that is what it happens. And it's all projected as a part of a scientific methodology. Let's understand the value, all of you know, if the virus is there, why would I get infected? The three interacting partners, one is the host called immune system, my innate ability, if I may get infected, how much virus I'm getting? I'm getting one virus, 10 virus, 1000 virus, million virus, what we typically call virus load. And third is, is the virus virulence? The virus must be very highly, highly effective in killing the host, are infecting in a much larger level, it is spreading in a much more. So all three together will define a disease process in a current scenario. And the problem we know. So if I take only the person's immune system and start concentrating on the individual healthcare without understanding how much virus load can come to that person and come to an area, and as of now we have no data about it, or I don't know what is the virulence, we will not be able to get a clear idea. About it. And believe me, Today, we have no idea about it. And I'll explain in the next five minutes about this. Now, spend five minutes on this slide. Now, let me create the same ontological scenario uh, for SARS CoV 2. But here I'm beginning, instead of putting a question inside, now I'm putting SARS CoV 2 because we know this is there. So I can understand the severity of the problem of the SARS CoV 2. And the severity is important for the hospital management and for the treatment of the patient, how severe the pathogenic pathological condition is, or I can, or, or, or what is the diagnostic? We all pay, whether do I go to a uh, antigen test, whether I go to antibody test, or go to RT-PCR test, and all kind of a report you see in the newspaper, in the scientific magazine, that uh, each one is telling something else. And the reason has a specific reason for it. I will not uh, go into detail. Time permits, question permits, we can discuss that. But if I try to understand the property of uh, this virus based on the human perspective of a disease and pathology uh, and the treatment uh, and diagnosis and cure, this will create a one question and one domain. But this question is incomplete because I have not defined many more properties of that virus. And therefore, today, in the absence of the rest of the what is shown in the white, which I will show you a little later, we are not able to understand why some people get killed, why some people are asymptomatic, why some people are uh, only mild symptoms they're getting is, we have no idea about it. But we are trying to cure. And let me come back to another aspect. Yes, it is a pandemic, it originated somewhere. It originated to a place, all of us know, I'll come back to that later. So I must understand from where from it is arising. Now, now that more and more information is coming, this pandemic is also become confined in their own reason. There are certain changes which are happening in the reason why change. So it is also becoming endemic. And some people who, who want to dis, dis, disprove single origin of the virus, and the country is all the time crying and no, no, this virus did not arise. They say there are multiple origins. This virus could have origin in Europe. This virus could have origin in the US. This virus could have origin in China. Uh, so they are saying, no, there are multiple origins. And why the multiple origin theory is emerging? Because of, uh, again, uh, the, the story is incomplete and the right question still has not been asked. So those people who are trying on their only pandemic property and fighting between understanding different changes and mutation and looking for origin and trying to divert attention on the world and not interacting with the terms of patho 
uh, pathogenesis or the diagnostic property, the property becomes incomplete. Now let me put into maybe it will be science aside. All of us are not problematic. It is severely a factor of the social system, the lockdown, the whole education system, the whole economy. I will come later. It is social behavior, human behavior. Everything has been heavier now because of that. So somebody, this whole bunch of people and the, and the government and people have to keep fighting for this purposes. How do I handle the social aspect of uh, this aspect? That's going to be another area. And, and the, the, the third uh, dimension could be, it is severely affected economy. And not only that, because of this effect on economy, this has also affected international relationship. So countries are fighting for different reasons, even though the, the, the underlying cause is, the, is the, the effect on the economy, but the, the expression comes in a different form. So, so this kind of a group of people are trying to understand a different part of it. But yet none would give you a correct answer because the most important component is missing out of these understanding is that how did the virus evolve? On this biology is asked a question, where did the, what is the evolution of virus? All of us know this is called genotic diseases. So what is the genesis, where from it come? So what I will do is, I will, so unless this part is discussed, so this part becomes a major node in the absence of this interacting property, if you bring in all other interaction, whatever form it created, each one will be fighting the battle. And indeed that is happening. And I am speaking in a different forum that unless we do, we focus on this part, and believe me, um, people, some people are studying it, but nobody has uh, real bothered about why this is happening. They're <coughs> trying to brush aside. Next five minutes, I will debate upon being a biologist. Let us understand how this virus evolved, what the genosis is. And this genosis will explain everything. This genosis will explain the pandemic. This genosis will also explain the severity and rest the impact of the society and the impact of the economy becomes sub secondary for us at this moment of time. So why this is pandemic? Now let me add at this point. There's a big debate going on. These viruses are RNA virus, single standard clusters and RNA virus is a fast mutating virus. And people often get confused, the mutational changes in a different context and we group them together as a human. HIV is also RNA virus, retrovirus, where it is not a same family, but it's a retrovirus, but it is a fast mutating virus, simply because HIV does not have a proof reading. HIV polymerase does not have a proof reading. The all coronavirus or nidovirus, in which family this belongs, they all have very strong proof reading. That means this virus does not make replicative error. The only changes, only mutation this virus can accumulate is because of a metabolic profile of the host. That means when it infects the host and when it's trying to establish itself in producing new variant, the host metabolic machinery, host immune system tries to put a pressure on the virus and this causes metabolic changes. And these metabolic changes, so let's say, oxidative DNA is a make called CTU change, which subsequently can become a 2 a thing. So this virus is mutating, but it is mutating primarily in terms of a insert and substitution, base substitution. And, and base substitution, a lot of things, I will come back to base substitution quickly, but none of the current mechanism will explain the base insertion. No metabolic pressure can add a base into that. The base insertion can only come to a process uh, called recombination. Now for recombination to happen, there's a lot more property which this virus has to acquire. Uh, and I will, in the next two, three minutes, I will come back to this slide. So remember, metabolic changes will happen, but it will happen into only the insertion and the substitution. It will happen with substitution, and, but not in terms of uh, base insertion. Now also, the changes we biologists, we know, I'll come back to that, the changes are happening in the virus. But in order for these changes to become fixed in the population and to subsequently become some property advantages or disadvantages to the, to the virus, then it has to infect the next one. That means there has to be selection pressure. As of now, there's no clear drug specifically targeting, there's no vaccine available. So all the changes are happening, happening without any selection pressure. So this also has to be clear, this is simply happening because of the change in the different population, different lifestyle in the population. Now, 
This all you know, the originally we know there's no question about it, originated from the Wuhan, China, and the two haplopoid G1 and G2, which is spread across the globe. And once it went to different countries and it started spreading within the each country, now if you take the virus and try to uh, uh, okay. So when it happened to Wuhan, people jumped and started saying, well, well this, this red one is the one what we call as a SARS-CoV-2, and uh, uh, this one is a called, this all belong to what is called a beta uh, coronavirus. In the middle where less has a, a four alpha, beta, gamma, delta. This one is the SARS-CoV-2 and CoV-1, both are beta family. Now, beta family also the, is presented to pangolin. And if you must have read somewhere, people saying, well, this virus might have come from pangolin. Now, if you think, if you do the whole genome sequencing, there is a, there is a virus which is found in the Wuhan in 2013, and this was called RATG13. This virus and present day virus has a 96.3% base identity. Now, whereas the pangolin has only 80% base identity. Why would you jump to the pangolin hypothesis of complicated? And if you compare with the other human coronavirus like SARS-1, it is only 76%. To say that it has come from SARS-1 to SARS-CoV-2 because the nomenclature which is confusing idea, they get confused in terms of origin of the virus. Somebody has done the sequence. Now, if you do the current sequence in each region, you will see China has a, a base uh, a substitution of one kind. USA has a base substitution of another kind. Europe has a base substitution of, it's all based on the sequence, whole genome sequence of the viruses now prevailing. This is the data till March. Now the more data available from the databases. Whereas the rest of the ACL, like a country like India has a mixed lineage of these viruses. So one thing is becoming very clear, the lifestyle and the genetic makeup or metabolic pattern of the each region is causing further change in the virus. Whether these changes are still fixed in the population to become a new acquired property or not, but definitely these changes, primarily it has come from a single origin and subsequently within each region, there are metabolic changes happening. And there are many more examples. In fact, the Singapore population has acquired a deletion and that deletion has advantage to the human population because that deletion causes less pathogenicity. Virus is not able to replicate with a 382 based per deletion in a war of N8. What I'm trying to explain to you, the, there is a single origin, but this virus is acquiring mutation. That means it's becoming endemic in the region where it is spreading. And the endemic is a function of the metabolic state and genetic makeup of that population. And India has a diverse genetic population and the rest of the Asia. So they can be Chinese origin, European origin, they can be American origin, depending upon the migration pattern, which is clearly indicated. So what I'm trying to explain is the origin of a virus in terms of pandemic based on this number of a data set available, your question is getting much more clear that how, uh, where from this virus has arisen. Now next two, three minutes, and then I'll be concluding, or maybe five minutes. I don't intend to tell you the whole virus is a virus, but the virus that is called Corona because it's a spike protein, green one. This is spike protein binds to a protein, membrane protein, which we call receptor. Receptor is for the virus, called ACE2. And upon binding, it gets engulfed by endocytose. And where it does then undergoes changes, it, uh, it, rep it replicates, it transcribes, it makes protein, and the virus comes out. So the first step for the infectivity and the severity generated for the virus is this binding to the ACE receptor. And this binding happens to the spike protein or colors. Now a spike protein, as we call it, has a two domain. Uh, this is spike protein is called has a S1 and S2. S1 binds to ACE2 and then a cleavage happens. The S2 fuses to the membrane, so membrane fusion is an integral property for the virus entry inside the cell. And this virus is a very efficient membrane fusion. It, it binds to ACE2 very efficiently compared to all other viruses. That means if, if one has to understand the, uh, the severity and the nature of this virus, one has to look for its ACE2 interaction and how does it fuse the membrane. Now here is a paper, I have, this is not my research, it's a, so this is the the domain structure of the spike protein, you will see S1 is for attachment to this, S2 is for fusion, and here RBD is the receptor binding domain. Now here is the property of RBD of the SARS-CoV-1, the one which happened again in China, originally China and World on in 2002, this is called SARS-S or S1 or 
pole one, this is pulse pole two. Now, if you see this red dot called S1, S2 boundary, this boundary is missing in pole one present in pole two. And what this is, this does, this is extremely important. And now this is called that if, if this S1 RBD has to remain in a conformation called up position. And this up position is only acquired in the virus when this arrow says there is a cleavage. And this cleavage site is absent until date in all known coronaviruses. So what I'm trying to tell you here is if this is the H2 receptor and this is the binding domain, binding domain is the lie down position. But once this cleavage happens, activation happens, this becomes an up position and the binding becomes perfect. So binding of this core one core two to the set H2 is because of a cleavage by a furin. And subsequent cleavage we call membrane fusion. So not important at this point of time that COF2 in unbound, unbound position. Very important for vaccine development and drug development. In unbound virus, would the RBD is not exposed, is low affinity. Only when it approaches the membrane and cleavage happens, the affinity becomes high and cleavage is a property. Now, so this cleavage is extremely important and only present in COF2. I'll explain. Now, if you again look at the structure of S1, the RBD, RBD, the red box you look into, this is the current virus, this is the pangolin virus. Remember, pangolin has only 80% nucleotide identity. However, the RBD of the virus of the pangolin is 100% amino acid identical. RBD is not at all similar to bat RATG3, which has a 96.3% base. Now, what is indicating? That means the virus base 96.3% identity with the bat virus could not have generated so much of a identity in terms of RBD. This is definitely coming from the pangolin. And more so, if pangolin and the bat becomes true, then if I look into the, the cleaver site or furin cleaver site, this furin cleaver site is absent in bat, is absent in pangolin also. This is called PRRA. Now it creates a more complicated. Now, if you, somebody creates an hypothesis came from a bat to pangolin in the human, this, this would have been true if only it looks into RBD. But the moment you bring into the cleaver site and cleaver site is making it the better virulent virus, then where from this cleaver site is emerging. And I turn out to be, if I have to explain this, now pangolin, it cannot come from, but pangolin doesn't have it. Remember, this is a base insertion. This is a not base substitution. Insertion can come only not by any metabolic mutation. It can only come through the combination. And for so that means the pangolin bat to the pangolin to the human is not true. Possibly, yes, the bat pangolin and some unknown uh, animal where this cleavage site is somewhere there till date nobody has found it out. Exact cleavage site present there. There are some uh, in like cleavage site. They have undergone the common. That means the virus must undergo uh, subsequent. Uh, a multiple infection of a uh, alpha virus versus a beta virus together in one common putative host. And this recombination has to undergo purifying selection. That means it has to sometime infect a human and then it has to become a deadly virus, as you know. Clearly indicating that, that, that the, this, this, uh, you need to have a multiple infection of a more than one virus type, either in a human or any putative host, this has to undergo recombination and that it has to further go on to the purifying selection. Now, I'm not saying whether it was created in the lab, but it is a, if you look into the chance factor of these three changes and a precise recombination, insertion of a six bases, which makes it more virulent, uh, which we call it a RBD furin cleaver site, then it, is, it tells a different story. Either it existed in the human population somewhere else, or if that is true, then many more viruses are already there, which will be more virulent in the population, and some people are finding it. But only way this answer can come if somebody goes to the origin site, Wuhan and China and Wuhan, and try to find out more viruses in the pangolin, in the civet, in the bats, and try to come. The clear picture will only emerge out of that. Not that by if I start comparing with the existing virus, which is becoming endemic to the each region and trying to come out of sequencing. So this event could have happened thousand years ago. See, recombination is a very slow event. And as of now, it's very difficult to predict the rate of recombination. 
how how far, how quickly will you combine? And this recombination has to happen precisely at the same position six times or two times, three times to create a perfect furin flavor cell. So it happened a year ago, a week ago, we don't know. Or it happens it is a human likely an outdoor market make. Whereas I want to put a big question. I don't want to conclude at this point of time. So what I'm trying to say, let me come back to my why I gave this example also to bring some, some understanding to you about the evolution of this virus is each one, everybody is trying to pick this virus as a blind person elephant. And depending upon if I want to a vaccine developer, I want to a drug repurposing person, or I want to look for economic impact on the economy, I want to look for impact on the social system, I want to look for its origin and pandemic in nature, each one is doing their own job. But nobody is asking the right question. The right question will be, what is the true interaction? So true ontological question of this virus can only come out with, in, in the biological system, what is called parasitism. The parasite and parasitism is an emergent property for this one. And this parasitism, there has to be parasite, there has to be host. In between, there can be a reservoir, and there has to be constant interaction with these two. Then only the property of this virus will be explained. Now, this is the one, I, what I wanted to explain to you, because the right question, as I said, if the right question is asked, half of the job is done. And as of now, I'm very sorry to say, I have told you the different forum, in the webinar, the people are not asking the right question of virus. The virus reason that. I mean, if I want to sequence again in the viruses in the back and pangolin, it is going to be expensive phenomena. Who will give me money to sequence run the NGS for a, thousands of viral virus coming from different animal genetic origin? But this has to be done if our objective is to. So it's a cost intensive. Right now, we want to put all cost into, uh, into curing human thing or, or for a disease or for a vaccine or for a drug. So I'm not blaming it. But what I'm trying to tell you, since the right question is missing, the actual understanding, the ontological understanding of the virus is missing. Now, my last slide. So what is I'm trying to tell you? If the question is not properly approached, if the, if the uh, the interacting system is components are not defined ontologically. The question is not asked. So we we'll say the first part in the research uh, mindset is questioning, but this question depends upon the ontological consideration, depends upon the interacting part. And once this is properly defined, and how do you define that in multiple ways? And once this has this has been done properly, then how do I go ahead with it? The epistemology tells me that I start asking questions, I start understanding the, what kind of a truth exists, and I, based on that, I design variables and testable hypotheses. And rest comes into the measurement or methodology. Methodology has to follow sensitivity, accuracy, and precision, which I'm not telling to you. And at the end, all the data set which you get, you have to put into analysis, and analysis can be various things, you could mention all minor things I'm not interested in. But ultimately, we are, we're doing all those, what we are hoping, we want to seek for the truth. But if this is not rightly asked, the truth will be not. Even though this is rightly asked, yet because of the different possibilities and because here the enough data sets may be missing, where the last data set will be required, so we will get a truth, but that truth will be still illusive. That means we, in a science, we, our, we want to search for a truth, we are trying to come closer to the truth, but yet truth is always slightly far away. And that's what becomes inspiration for these scientists to keep working and working and keep in the quest of searching for the truth, we keep working our life now. And the truth remains a little far off. Of it. But in the end of the day, we learn quite a great deal of that. And with this, I thank you all for my kind listening and any question and answer, I'll be happy to answer question in any different direction and any different dimension of it. Thank you all. Thank you very much, sir. I'm very sure uh, the participants have questions. You can post it in your chat box and uh, sir can see that. Um, so questions uh, from the audience. I think now everyone has started uh, looking. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Sir, I had one question. Maybe yeah. that will then start. Um, see, um, bats are a very good host for a large number of viruses. And um, I also realized that your main area of interest is also inflammation. Yeah. And uh, in this uh, present uh, COVID-19, 
um, one thing is uh, your immunity, but more than that, your own immune system becomes overwhelmed. So you have a, a big boost of the cytokines and due to which you ultimately people die. So viruses, uh, these bats, how do they take care of this uh, yeah. large? They are, a, I think, very big host for many of the viruses. This is excellent and, uh, question. And that's very interesting, which are, everyone would be thinking around. Like. In fact, this is the first question, my interest into SARS-CoV-2 to begin with. One of the media person uh, in, in mid-February approached me and they said, sir, you are from a zoologist and we are creating a program on News 18. Can you give us a bite about why bats are not getting infected and why only bats have these viruses? The two questions they asked, that why the, the bats are immune, bats are not getting infection and why now, so I have, uh, so obviously I am not a bad person. I'm not a virologist, but I had to uh, dig out the answer and I have a, a very well studied answer. For that. First of all, there's no, yes, you are right. The bats are reservoir for large number of viruses. And that is why bats, there's no specific reason. Because 20% of the mammalian population next to rodents are bats. Bats, yeah. And bats are only flying mammal as of now. If you look into the, the whole, uh, the, 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 what you call it, distribution of the bat families out of the 19 different families that they have, they, they're across the globe, except Antarctica, Antarctica, everywhere you have bats. No other animal has such a pandemic distribution as you have a bat. And being a flying mammal, they can cross the okay. barriers and move. So, so one is there's no specific reason why bats are extra because of their unusual flying nature uh, and they live longer. Compared to their size of the bats, the size is slightly larger than rat or close to guinea pig, etc. weight wise. If you compare their lifespan versus weight, the average bat lives for 20 to 30 years. Whereas similar size mammals lives hardly for three to four to maximum six years. So they live longer. They're flying animals and they are pan, pan globe uh, expression. So they keep getting infection. I mean, now question is, why do they? Uh, so the, people have done mathematical modeling and recently it went done the PNS paper and there's no specific genotic preference for coronavirus for the bat. They happen to be the last and they remain in a crowded space. Yeah, so no the social distancing. It's, become, it's very crowded. I mean, no other animal mammals lives in such a crowded area the way when they occupy. So there are various uh, there are reasons why they are, they, are, they are like that. In terms of why do they don't get infected? In fact, that is the question which the Wuhan lab was do, studying. And the SARS-1, which also originated in Rwanda and China, and people did not tell that we don't have a vaccine for even SARS-1, SARS-CoV-1 we call. So they said, well, SARS-CoV-1, which also probably originated from bad, bad or so on. So they started looking at the immune system of that. And I have a slide, if time permits, I can open the slide and show you. But these viruses are highly evolved viruses. So when they infect human being, they have a the structure, they have a uh, envelope protein, uh, membrane protein, spike protein, and the capsid protein, these are five major proteins. In addition to five major proteins, they have 16 other smaller proteins. Out of 16, six or eight will make the polymerase and transcriptase complex. Mm -hmm. This one. But remaining protein, like there's a protein called, uh, 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 this is called PLP, it's a protease. It's NSP3, non structure protein 3, and NSP5. Now, these proteases are important for the processing of the protein. But in addition to virus wants to survive, so what do they do? The first thing these protein do, they try to degrade our uh, uh, innate immune uh, mm. uh, proteins like our interferon regulatory uh, transcription factors that are degraded specifically with these are. So when they infect us, they try to dampen our immune response so that they are replicating the other fusion because of Now, if this is the right, then the bat should not have, yes. The bat has a, a very intense dampen called NLRP3. NLRP3, which is a innate immune response and bat also have a uh, dampened immune response so what do they do? Bat has a different immune system. Even the viruses replicate, they replicate at a low level, and those immune markers are, are, are suppressed. We have those markers, 
But cleverly, when this virus comes into our system, it suppresses one of the proteins of this virus called ORF8. Now, ORF8 degrades interferon 3 innate immune system, degrades. So, when the ORF8 is expressed, and our interferon 3 innate system becomes invalid, and then we become more susceptible to infection. SARS CoV 1 did not have ORF8 over the two part. Incidentally, Singapore population, the deletion of 3A22 base pair happens in ORF8. So, Singapore current virus, one of the virus of SARS CoV 2, is a very poor infector. It is not able to, the, the, the pathogenesis is a very poor, patients are healthy, patients can be carried. Now, one what you are trying to do is absolutely, the bat has a, oh, um, if you uh, give me a minute, uh, I think that will be my, half a minute and then I will uh, come back to that. Uh, So I just want to quickly uh, see this is the, I had to uh, take out these slides. No problem, sir. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is the bad distribution uh, which I am showing to you. And uh, why I'm not able to. Sir, we can see the screen. Oh, screen. Okay. Just a minute. Yeah. Just a minute. Just a minute. Uh, new stop sharing. So I'm sharing the screen, not. Okay. Just a minute, just a minute. Are you able to see now the slide? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Yes, sir. This is the yes, sir. of the bat. Yeah. This is the cross the board. And these are the, uh, depending upon the number of the species it has, the more virus. 409 species is the Vesper Nidae and has a maximum number of viruses. So it is simply by chance, there's no any genotic preference why this have a viruses. And this is the one. So if you see, this is what we call as a is immunity, mostly in terms of a dampening TNF, dampen NRRP3. And it is a flight, and this is a very recent paper which has come into 7th July 2020. So people have now studied it, and precisely we know why that have a and in our cases, we have all this system. But if the virus will infect, it cleaves our own innate, innate immunity proteins and allows to then it is actually to explain it. Whereas in case of bat, it is not able to do that because of this process. Reduce uh, It is senescent senolytic antivirals expression, the inhibitor of uh, this G gas assisting system, it interferes gamma 3 response system. So bat already have a reduced system. So virus has no way to. Uh, in, uh, and whereas it's, it's a innate immunity is high. So it's a bat has a unique, and in fact, if you want to get an answer, we have to go back to, back to really understand it. And no, there's no way by studying human variation, human population, we'll be, we'll be never be able to understand about this virus properly. It has to, be, it has to be understood through the bat and genosis has to be understood properly. In fact, the reverse genosis is also happening. From human to civet, the viruses mm -hmm. have been demonstrated to be operating. So there's no specific reason, but the bats are unique. No question. <laughs> yeah. And the virus is also unique. And there's no social distancing in uh, bats. Definitely. They're always in very crowded no, places. No. I'm sorry, this crowding is helping the viruses to spread. To spread. But because of the dampened NLRP3, they have become down. They're not reacting. In fact, in our system, let me tell you, all of you know, we don't die because of infection. No parasite will kill you. We yes. are dying because of the ACE2 being chosen as a receptor. When ACE2 is blocked, the vasoconstriction, induction of apoptosis, the fusion of the membrane, and the whole lungs becomes non-functional. Mm -hmm. So virus, for some reason, chose ACE2 to bind, and because of ACE2 binding, and this system, is sensed by our immune system as a very alarming signal. Alarming. And all our immune thing like uh, interferon, uh, Burst. Uh, the IL-6, uh, alpha, they all are, we typically call them as a septic septicemia or typically called cytokine storm. 
So virus is not inducing cytochemistry. Virus is only binding to H2 as a consequence of better H2 binding, and the subsequent phenomena happens. Our lung becomes non-functional, but our immune system becomes heavier. So at one point, I want a good innate immunity, but yeah. later part, I want a dampened immunity at that point. I don't want the reaction to happen. This is a very tricky scenario. Very thin window one has to really cure the patient at that point. So there are some questions in the chat box. Yeah. Uh, when uh, uh, Nilima Prabhu she has asked, kindly uh, throw light on what aspects of data or areas on COVID-19 can our PG and UG students work on during this lockdown since they will not be able to work in lab? Why was the spread not noticed in China except for one? <laughs> See, this is exactly, I, I would answer this because one is, let me answer this most quickly. See, there is a, uh, only uh, the students can do the same thing. So. I am not a great person, a great virologist, and a great uh, bat person. I simply went back to literature, collected all the information, compiled it to make a coherent understanding. Yeah. So one is the students can do the a literature search, pull out these papers information, and create a, a coherent story about this information which I am doing. So they can do, uh, they have to do extensive literature search, and one can give a different area and topic. Like one, you ask why bats are uh, insensitive? Why bats are more uh, carrying the viruses? So what is the distribution of the bats? Somebody can do that collection data. Somebody can ask the data and that, that uh, as I mentioned, that why, uh, the, or how many viruses are there in the bats? Are, uh, so, so one can, from a zoological angle, take it and only survey the data and collect the information at, as of now. Also, somebody can also, uh, those who are good at bioinformatics, now largely what you need to do is pull out these databases and try to see how many, now I think more than 50,000 sequences are available. So those who can do a little bit of bioinformatic comparison, they have to pull out the different reason why databases. Like one slide I showed, this was one of the postdoc student, she pulled out 519 viruses from the databases, simply did the alignment and picture emerged out to be region specific mutations. Until that, nobody had aligned that way. People are aligning, but if you try to align based on the a smaller alignment, like a, a, a receptor binding domain, you will get a different pattern. So people, those who are good at bioinformatics can pull out the databases and do the alignment that way. Now, question, what you are asking is the, so, so students can do a lot of work, but it has to be literature-based survey or database survey. Database will require some, some understanding of the bioinformatics tools like uh, uh, alignment tools and uh, comparison tools, uh, phylogenetic analysis. Uh, the, even they can calculate what is called rate of evolution. So in 30 years, this how fast this virus is changing. Because the, the rate of mutation in virus is a uh, 2 into 10 to minus 4 uh, per base pair. So basically it means uh, two nucleotides uh, per month is changing. A given oh. It's very slow. It's not as fast as it could take. People say it's very fast mutating. From a drug development, it could be fast. But for an organism point of view, it is not fast. So people can collect those information. What is the rate of the virus evolution? What is the rate of change? What kind of a changes in which population? As I mentioned, Singapore population, ORF8 deletion. Mm. So why it is so specific? So the, I would not rely on why this did not happen in spread in China. Okay. I would never trust, believe me, let me people go it open, let it go public that I'm criticizing China. I am not trusting China at any point at this point. Reason being simple is, as I said, if I want to do research in a wet lab, I have to go back to the China, look for the, the wild population, collect more information, and then only I can create a first-hand information. They're saying, we will provide you the already sequenced data. Don't come back to sequence, find out the animals from here. The Wuhan lab, they have destroyed all the virus samples at all. Oh. The second the, the mischief I'm trying to tell you, if I want to say, people say SARS-1, SARS-CoV-2. Now, the moment I say CoV-1, CoV-2, we start jumping on as if CoV-1 and CoV-2 are related. Because the two nomenclature is such that it's related. 
But China mischievously named the virus SARS-CoV-1 evolved in Wuhan, Wuhan. And COVID-2 has evolved in, has originated from the Wuhan. Why it is not called Wuhan virus? Why SARS-CoV-1 is not called Wuhan virus? Because the moment you tell the virus origin by name, you start then trying to look for the geno genetic distribution of yeah. the virus in that region. Then you will get a clicker picture, but they want to hide it. Whereas, whereas, let me tell you, wait, I have a slide and we want to show it. When in 1918, the virus uh, happened in Spain and pandemic. Spanish flu. Why it is called the Spanish flu? And, and in, in, in New Delhi, we had a strain of bacteria which are resistant. It is called New Delhi strain. Mm. And why the other coronaviruses which happened in the Congo, River, Congo in Ebola, River called Ebola virus? Why the other coronavirus, which is the Malaysia called Nepa virus? And why the MERS virus in the Southeast Arabia called MERS virus? All other viruses are named based on the origin where the outburst happened so that you can understand the distribution and origin in biology. And China very cleverly by naming it, by influencing. I'm sorry, the big scientists have been influenced by China. And in the origin, if people were calling it the Wuhan virus, China's newspaper were always objecting. Their, their, their uh, politicians were objecting, don't call it the Wuhan virus. And today, nobody is calling the Wuhan virus. And they have, they have, they have, uh, I'm extra, they have influenced the WHO to name it as a SARS CoV 2, as if CoV 2, CoV 2 and CoV 1 has a 76% relationship. Maximum relationship is a RATZ 13, a bat virus, which was being researched yeah. by Zhang Li in the Wuhan virus. That virus, so that means the platform of the sequence comes from the RATZ 13, which was being exper experimented. So, a, so, so at that point, if I want to really understand it, I have to collect more data from China from where these two viruses originated. And I would not rely on the secondary information given by the Chinese because they can hide anything. If the 10 lakhs people have died, they will say only 1,000 people died. So I don't, we don't trust it. Sir, so there's a question from Dr. Nath. Hmm. He says, uh, dear Professor Chaturvedi, very interesting talk and informative. And uh, a curiosity and a query to you, as it happens in evolution, COVID-19 is also likely to undergo mutational events and may evolve further. Hmm. Are there any studies going on to model such type of future productive trend? How virulent? the mut mutant strains would be any theoretical model available? Even, uh, uh, <laughs> Vimal, there is a paper, I, if you want to, I can first send it to you. It has been already done. Not theoretical, actual mutation. One group, they used okay. uh, uh, in another backbone of the virus, they took the RBD and have done the mm -hmm. allergy scanning mutant and generated various mutants of the receptor binding domain. And then they have crystallized that sequences, done the um, binding studies, and that study says, in fact, when that, that study was published, I will send you the paper, a newspaper item came that more virulent sars cov virus are in offing. This it says the present binding is only 30% efficient binding. Whatever has called havoc at this one time, yeah. only 30% efficient. In the lab, at least RBD has been created, which can be better RBD binding, H2 binder in the SARS CoV 2. Now, this has been created in the lab, but very cleverly they have done it by taking the back, some other backbone. Now, the question is if I'm using a somebody else's backbone and creating a better binder, imagine if this virus goes back to a reservoir and undergoes a recombination, and this gets copied into a, a, a full-length active virus, you will have another havoc coming. Yeah. And probably something of this kind has happened in present SARS-CoV-2. If you don't believe in the lab creation, then what is going to happen? You will believe as if, as if such viruses are already existing, they may be happening. Then we have to get many more better binder of it so that means we need to go back to Wuhan again and search for more viruses there. But yes, research, one group has done it and this binding is only 30% binding and better binders can evolve, can be there in the nature. And experimentally in the lab, people have created it. Only in terms of RVD binding, better binders have been created. 
So there's one question from uh, Jyoti Malia. She says, uh, compliments to you, sir. Nice and informative session. Were there any cytokine or antibody similarity studies seen? 5% affected population who become severe or any similarity in unsymptomatic? You know, I, I, I keep crying. This is an excellent question. You know, the, for, since I uh, I've given a couple of webinars at a higher level also, but nobody listens to it. So I only keep giving lectures at this point. Right? No, no, we are all listening, sir. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm telling not to you. Those policy yeah, makers. I know. Right? And our big bosses sitting in ICMR, DST, DVD. Yes. And I'm telling you them. No, what was needed for India? Now, this people who are going to, or who are dying, as of now, we have a capital 2.67%, not even 3%. But in terms of percentage Indian population, if I say, under 30 crore and everybody gets infected, which very soon, the general estimate is, is the based on the testing, at least 10 times more. If we have done, a, let us say, 10 lakh or 40 lakhs testing, that means we have at least 4 crore as of now, uh, 40 million people who are positive, positive. Only a simple thing which is required for the patient. Take out 2 ml blood from each patient, symptomatic, asymptomatic, and etc. So give to the research labs, which have mm -hmm. a uh, fax machine and which can do cytokine profiling. There are the, the, the ELISA plate comes with a coated with a, some 30 to 40 different cytokine profiling. So simply India on their own level to understand the innate immunity. This is true. We have a good innate immunity like that. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. Otherwise, the whole WHO was looking towards Dharavi. They were saying Dharavi is going to be a term of corona. Oh. Nothing happened. And uh, they expected, and after the Dharavi is uh, zero uh, death. Yes, and definitely. So, so clearly indicating those people who are living close to nature, uh, what is the closer to nature? Forgive me, the nature is dirty today. We don't like nature. Nature is polluted today. We don't like the pollution. So we want to be in air filtered air. We want air conditioned room. We want filtered water to be here. But Dharavi people didn't have anything. So their innate community was trained to live into current day nature. Therefore, they will be less infected. Even if you look into the, the today's the pandemic pattern, it is a clearly urban metropolitan pattern. You will not find people try to brush aside. Yes. It's all about the testing degree. It's wrong. I know the, the village people are much more vigilant nowadays. Yeah. Not a single death is happening. They are much more taking social distancing. Cities people are not following. But will, the death in total villages are in the suburban and rural population much less than the death that is happening into. So, for example, Delhi. Today, Delhi has released a pattern maximum death. And most vulnerable population in Delhi is no, which Delhi? Okay. Most post, lead in Delhi. Yeah, I know. So what is indicated? That is more away from the nature you have. So your, your innate immunity, use or lose it, is subdued and you are much more. And this could have data could have easily be obtained. There are five six markers of innate immunity, which can be profiling, can be done in one ELISA. And one injection in the fax machine, I could have created my dendritic cell profile, my NK cell profile, my neutrophil profile, my monocell profile, and would have created a nice pattern. But remember, no drug company is interested in that one. I tell you why I this is a big, I said politics, politics, economics is governing that. Now, if the drug company comes and finds Indian people are already innately immune, the vaccine will not be sold. Each one is looking for a uh, 100, 100 million vials for the vaccine to be sold. So if, if, if somebody comes out a study, the plan is study, say, well, Indians don't need vaccine, uh, the 80% population are already innately immune to the virus, the vaccine will not be required. So they will not let such a study to happen. I mean, same with the drug lobby, pharma lobby. These are very strong. They don't let a cost-effective drug, a cost-effective. And people say the vaccine is being developed. They are all hitting in the dark. Why would 130 different types of the vaccine has to be tried if people are understood the virus? So each one is hoping in the dark, maybe my vaccine will succeed. And each company is trying three to four types of vaccine. If one has to be successful, to make them a billion dollar market. So for them, this pandemic, I did not elaborate the other half of it. For them, the, the ontological question for those people is not the, the virus origin and death of the people. For them, the question is where, how to make the billion dollar market. 
So each one, they, based on the question, their whole analysis, their whole methodology, they're adopting a different methodology than, than us. So this is a very deep-rooted question. Indians, believe me, we have, and this I've been maintaining from day yeah. one. I've been maintaining from day one with China. <laughs> Each, each analysis I analyze from ontological origin. Yeah. And then, and then immediately find out what methodology they must be using to answer because they have a very hidden ontological question and therefore the methodology is altogether different. And we think they are very humanity purpose. They want to cure human beings. No, their purpose is to make money. Kale Sahib, aap ko pushna? Aha, ye, namaskar. Namaskar, uh, um, it has been read that uh, due to global warming, uh, icebergs are melting and probably some viruses that are totally unknown to us might be there in the environment. So is it a possibility like that? Sir, I would, I, first of all, let me tell you, uh, when we say viruses, I'm just taking a little lecture. Hmm. Our idea becomes that viruses are uh, something which is nucleotide sequences, something because our human ego is such that we want to be always superior. Let me tell you, <laughs> these viruses like today's SARS CoV 30,000 nucleotide, every nucleotide is yeah. very meticulously used. It uses all molecular principle, which I call molecular biologist nightmare, the kind of mechanism it uses. But what I'm trying to tell you is these are the organisms. These are the living organisms. They may be parasitic. We may call them virus for different reasons. But so they may be everywhere. So I'm not surprised if more viruses are emerging. In fact, even our own body, there's a large number of resident viruses which are in which are uh, part of our genome and they're active viruses. Anytime they may recombine and they may get so why to go to uh, Antarctic on ice melting? Our own body sometimes under different conditions, a new virus can emerge from our own own uh, work. So it's quite possible. Uh, and mm. many, many, we have not understood the way bacteria we have not understood because of metagenic yeah. approach. Now we know uh, that 9.99% bacteria are non culturable. Mm. So we have been only knowing earlier classification of bacteria based on 0.01% bacteria. So, yeah, so uh, there's a whole bunch of repertoire of virus which are going to be discovered, which are going to come out. And, because, and changes in the climate, definitely. For example, why this is spread of these viruses is happening? Clear cut. Destruction of ecological niche of the bat. The bat doesn't want to come. I, I start eating the bat. And, and, and classical examples that I'm taking a little, you know, the, when SARS-1 was happened, and if you read the paper, ask the students to dig out the paper, they found the bat has the sequence similarity, a lot of similarity to the human SARS-1. So, Hypothesis was made, the human SARS-1 came out of the bat. Mm -hmm. Same in the market, in the, um, where they were Open eating. market. Somebody found, it was not a Wuhan, but it was a wet market of the Wanda. That time. In 2003, they found the, the, the cat family called Seawet. They eat it. They found the Seawet has a virus which is 100% identical to the human virus. So they said, oh, from the bat, it went to Seawet. And civet it came to human, and they killed millions of civet at that time. Till somebody went in the wild type civet and started searching for a virus, they did not find the virus at all. That means what had happened is the poor civet, that they had got the virus 100% article from human through a process called reverse genosis. Now, what I'm trying to say is this, this kind of a because of our changing habitat, changing habits, changing climate, many new combinations and many new pattern of the viruses are going to emerge in the population. And viruses simply are doing nothing. They want to survive. If they want to use us as a host, they have to learn the molecular mechanism of our host. And through process of back and forth, they have to undergo typically called purifying selection. And a virulent virus will come out. But no virus will ever kill a human. 
Remember, Ebola was yeah. 40% more virulent than this one. So Ebola, kid, anybody infected with Ebola, 40% people would die. Here only 3%, only 14% people. <coughs> but in India, it is less than 3%. And some population in a 10%. But average is around 3 to 4%. So, sir, is it that uh, selfish gene concept is really true? Sir, let us not call, I think you must be knowing that even though people still promote, no gene is ever selfish. And I don't <laughs> say, gene doesn't want to, it is, it is an interaction between different organisms, a, a different pattern of a genetic backup gets established in a population. It's a random phenomenon. The gene would not do it purposefully to establish itself in the population so that it has advantage for survival, it has advantage for spreadness. Uh, probably mm -hmm. uh, evolution doesn't do that. Evolution doesn't have a purpose. It, it happens in a random way. So even the selfish term, people have been using it, but, and, and it's a very well established, it has been coined by famous uh, population uh, geneticists. Uh, but I, I have my reservation to use selfish. So I simply say, these are the sequences, these are the uh, which can be established in a population in a neutral way. And sometimes mm -hmm. this may have an advantage to the given organism. So there's one more question from Nilima Prabhu. Uh, thank you, sir. Very nicely explained. Could the theory that there is a relationship between the use of waves, she says, uh, from the radio waves to 5G now, have been responsible for the death of cells in such a way that it has released such viruses. She wants to know whether it can be authenticated or it's just one. These are too, too wild a question to yeah. go later at this moment of time. Uh, uh, so this is a, now, see the, these radio waves and etc. they do definitely uh, infect our system. They do influence our system, maybe low level and not be high enough uh, uh, to that level. I can, even I can tell you my own uh, perception, uh, but my personal thing. If I use the whole day my earphone and do a meeting from nine o'clock morning to six o'clock evening, I start getting acute headache. Oh. I'm not used to that. So, so gradually I want to use, even though my voice is low, I want to go without anything. So what I'm trying to say is these microwave would affect human physiology, but there is no, as of now, there is no data, as I said, ontologically, to draw a relationship to establish your question as a good ontological question. So I would, uh, is it, is it yeah. too, too provocative, but no data available to support that. I think one last question from uh, one Mr. Durlav Singha, whether virus can be regarded as more smarter when compared to other microbes in terms of mutability, adaptive, adaptability, and other attributes. What was the first part? Whether, virus whether viruses can be regarded as more smarter most smarter, oh. smart, smarter, uh -huh. when compared to other microbes. No, you know, I, uh, you know, uh, see this question. My this topic was I wanted to change the focus of the corona based on the uh, the uh, network interactions on the question. I I changed this whole yes. system, but whenever I want to give this lecture on corona specific, my first slide always begins with look why to blame this coronavirus? How lovely it looks how beautifully designed it is, how symmetrical design it is. If you, if you look from that angle, there are definitely smarter viruses. How come each virus is able to find, interact with a protein I know. and they call this our receptor? Now, we didn't say H2 is designed to cleave angiotensin 2 into ang one and 7. H2 is not a receptor. H2 is a receptor for virus. So these viruses definitely, their survival instinct but remember, never make a mistake of saying present a virus as a primitive virus. They may have an ancient origin, but they are equally evolved as of today. Yeah. Because how would this virus learn that one of the proteases, which is required to cleave the polyprotein into smaller proteins, same protease also cleaves interferon regulatory transcription factor, so to dampen our interferon response. So how this association has developed, this could have only developed by constant interaction with the host and infecting host and gradually seeing how I can be a better virus. So these are equally evolved and they're designed. I think as a, as a biologist, you all know, you know, tobacco mosaic virus was the first virus. Yeah. And the person 
who found out how the protein core of tocopamides, how beautifully protein assembly happens. This, if you look at the design, they have the marvels of design. Even uh, like the Lambda virus or, or TMD virus, I could say the head is structured. Yeah, exactly. So, so pro pro protein chemists, they have a marvelous arrangement. And the person who studied the protein arrangement, Adam Clark, got Nobel Prize for understanding the protein arrangement in that. Now, why would viruses have a protein and they design themselves? Why should this white protein look like a corona and the trimary protein becomes so nicely arranged? It's a beautiful design. So from protein assembly design point, indeed, they are very nicely evolved organisms. They, are, uh, they, they may not have a brain like, and their evolution is going for the survival. So they have learned yeah. all the molecular tricks. Our evolution might have gone for cognitive development as we call it ourselves. And today we felt as if we have conquered the moon, we can go to the center Mars, we can do artificial intelligence. But this 100 nanometer virus now brought us all of down on our knees. We don't know how to kill it. We are completely at loss. So human ego, and this is typical, we make an error called anthropocentric error when our ego comes out. As if evolution ends to us and we are the most evolved organism on this planet. We are equally evolving. And tomorrow we never know, thousand years later, the human population, which is surviving in the, uh, in the, in the uh, Dharavi, they will be dominating the rest of the globe. Because they would have, a, they would have learned how to adapt to the, the polluted environment, polluted water, polluted climate. We would all be gone. So viruses are very clever, equally uh, evolved, and yes, very smart organism. No question about it. Sir, I think uh, you also gave a very good insight on uh, basically how to go about research, how to ask the right questions, pursue it in the right direction, and sometimes what you think may not be the real one. Yeah. So we can just go on and on listening to you, but I'm very sure we'll have another forum uh, again to listen to you and especially designed for our young, uh, enthusiastic uh, undergraduate students. So we shall be meeting again. Sure. May I now request our very uh, young principal, uh, Dr. Imanchu Davda, to propose the vote of thanks. Himanshu, sir? Yes, madam. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. And a very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of RJ Khabili, I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude and thanks to our guest speaker for the day, Professor Madan Mohan Chaturvedi, who gave an excellent insight into research mindset quest for truth. A good research closes doors for speculation but a good researcher opens the doors for specifications. Unless you ask question, you answer no question. That is what our expert, Professor Chaturvedi, has stressed upon. No research problem or a proposal can be defined, explained, executed, and established in a single domain. Multi-domains define the science and the scientific research too. What is very amazing, friends, that our expert well connected and communicated this to the present pandemic in the context of philosophical and practical aspects of the research that he himself shared with us in the early part of his talk. Thank you very much sir, for this wonderful insight into what research should be and presenting us the research in its original shape, size, structure, and the soul. Well, friends at RJ College, for any such meetings, we always feel very proud and very privileged and very happy. You know why? Because at RJ College, for such meetings, we always have our mentors, our teachers, and our well-wishers always present to encourage us. I see here our beloved Dr. Professor S.M. Karmarkar, whom we owe a lot Whatever little we are today is because of sir. So thank you, sir, for being with us here. Dr. B.B. Nath, Nath, sir, you have always been with us as a great well-wisher and you a know. support. Uh -huh. And in every endeavor that we undertake, we rely a lot on you for the help that we need. Thank you, sir. 
I have with here with me here Dr. P. G. Kari, who along with our former principal and the present director, Dr. Usha Mukundan, has been instrumental in designing this lecture series. And without them too, these two, it would have been impossible for us to do this. So thank you. Dr. Namita Singh, all the way from Hissar, who is on the governing uh, council of Junjumala College. Madam, you have always been there supporting us. Thank you. All my dear members of Association of Teachers of Biological Sciences, Mumbai chapter, my colleagues from the Department of Botany, from other faculties of RJ College, postgraduate students, research scholars, and last but not the least, Mr. D.B. Prasad Shetty, who arranges everything technically so silently so that we can break up our silence and interact. So thank you one and all. Hope to see you all very soon. Meanwhile, stay safe, safe and stay healthy. Thank, thank you one and all. Thank you. Namaskar.